<laughs> uh, All right, what's the question, sir? How do battle maps and miniatures influence the flexibility and creativity of game sessions? Well, they're fixed, right? They're 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 static. They they are what they are. You can't really, unless you're really clever at Photoshop and super fast, you can't really change the battle map on the fly. So whatever you laid out is going to be the whole thing. But if you're a dirty, filthy story gamer like <laughs> me, you have the option to go, ah, oh, shit, that went a little too fast. Uh, maybe the next room I'm going to have a secret door that's going to lead to another chamber that's going to have treasure in it, but the treasure will be cursed. And if they try and take the treasure, it'll wake up the Guardians and they'll have to fight the Guardians for the treasure. Yeah, okay, I'm going to add that in. A little hard when you're using a battle map. You're going to immediately switch to theater of the mind for that bit. So, you know, I mean, you're going to run into the restrictions of what you see. And like I said, when I used to do uh, battle maps, oh, sorry, the big boy wants to come say hi tonight. Um, the um, the limitation that always drove me nuts was find, especially when I stepped outside of fantasy, trying to find battle maps for superhero games. Oy, gavolt, it's insane. It's really, really hard. Isn't so that called like a uh, street view? Google Maps street oh view. Oh my god, that's all, that's all you can do at this point in time, right? Like, you know, try okay, try and find a battle map of a shopping mall. Good luck. Con 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 Connell, hold, Connell, hold on to that. This is Bear's time. So, so those limitations get in the way. Those limitations cause the problems of impacting your flexibility. And that's something I would always say about that. I mean, you can, yeah, if you're swapping terrain out, Cal, that's great. But it's not easy for the most of us, hmm. especially using battle maps and not terrain where you have multiple pieces and you can just throw together a quick scene. That's all I'm saying. Since you have used battle maps, yeah. what steps do you take to ensure that battle maps don't restrict player creativity or choices? Now, before... Before we are talking specifically how battle maps do it, but in this case, how is it that you make sure that the battle maps don't limit the players? How do I make sure battle maps don't limit the Re players? Don't restrict the don't restrict the the creativity of the players. I don't because you can't. They're going to be as creative as they are within the choices that are available to them. The limitations are there. Their creativity is going to be how they get around those limitations or how they in, in, interact with the, the battle map itself. Do you, do so, you, so I guess, uh, do you, um, do you explain that to them? Like the, the, the example we had the video before where Crafty is talking about, you know, pay, players forget that they can slide across the table, pick up a chair and beat somebody with it, you know, whatever. Do you explain to players, especially if they keep fumbling around or they're always just looking at the map, like, Hey, you can do these things or do you just leave it up to them to figure it out? Well, well, that's a, that's a very, very dangerous line to walk. Some players want you to help them. Some players want you to do everything for them. Some players never want to hear a goddamn peep out of you, about what they should be doing or what they can do. They're going to do it all themselves. It's going to depend on your table. It's going to depend on your players. It's going to depend on how your relationship with them is. It's going to depend on how well you know them. I ran a, um, a pickup game during COVID with some people from a group we were all in. And I added this one person from outside the group who was a friend of mine. And she was so obsessed. We were playing OSE, but she was so obsessed with trying to get uh, uh, flanking. She would always ask about it. And it drove another player insane. Why is she always like, man, man, he went off. Like he was like so angry about it. That, that sounds like good cool. tactics to me. Well, but the thing is, is that he quit the group over it because for him, it was like, that's not good role playing. And it's like, everybody's different. Yeah. So all I do is set the goddamn scene, listen to what they want to do, and answer their questions when they ask them, because that's all I can do. If I see them going down a, a, a really bad place, I'm going to say, hey, do you want some input here? And if they say, yeah, I'm going to say, great. Give me an intelligence check versus 12. Let's see if you get this information. Okay, you made a 13. You can't help but notice blah, 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 blah. Now they still have to put the pieces together in their head. I haven't told them what to do, but I've added an aspect of there's an asset here for you, or there's a, a an environmental condition that you could maybe exploit if you were choosing to do so. One of the things I fucked around with when I was doing my own uh, BX hack, which I will never publish, uh, was the idea of uh, rooms having tags, like from Fate, narrow, cold, slippery, 
things like that. And then with those tags, the players can try and use them to get effects. If it's narrow, well, that weapon you have that has long as a, as a tag on it ain't going to work so well in this narrow space, mm -hmm. right? So you might want to think about changing to a different weapon. But that doesn't do with the map. That's a description as well of the situation. Sure. If you were doing that with a map, it would be helpful to the players because then they would know well, what tags are in the room, what do I, you know, blah, 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 blah. But ultimately, I let the players do what they want. I respond to what they ask. And sometimes when they don't ask the right questions, shit bites them in the ass. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, the, the the flanking thing, going with what we were talking about before, uh, in terms of you know just worrying about the numbers, that's just standard good tactics. Like that wouldn't bother me. Now, if somebody was like, "Hold on, I'm fighting this person here, but I have a flanking maneuver at this guy, so I'm going to totally ignore the guy that's in my face that I'm fighting right now and just turn to shoot that one because I have a plus whatever because I'm now considered flanking or harried or whatever." That's yeah. where that's where I lose my shit. <laughs> like yeah. that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, but the numbers better. That just makes sense for me to. You know, but that's okay because then you go great. And now in his turn, he's got flanking on you, so I guess he'll have advantage on this roll against you. Whoa, 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 whoa. Well, you specifically said you ignored the guy in front of you and turned to face the other guy. Well, this guy now has an open shot on you, and I'm going to give him advantage to do so, or bonuses, or whatever the case may be. Sure. So you teach the players. Like, like Max was saying earlier, by having the villains and having the opponents and having the NPCs do intelligent things in front of them, you are encouraging them subtly to think about things they can do and treat it more organically all right well let's see if mr max has passed to this question how do paddle maps and miniatures influence the flexibility and creativity of well i won't say your of just game sessions how can they battle maps and miniatures influence the flexibility and creativity of game sessions well they can influence like like a big problem that i have with battle map you know like the last time i was in was about the zero prep gaming right yep. i'm big into that i, I like things you don't being done on the fly and that's a big problem with battle map for me because like now like if you prepare some battle map or if you use some terrain and you prepare a diorama and stuff like that right or if you do the vtt and you prepare the scene with the dynamic lighting and sh all that stuff you will want to use it it's going to be very hard and now you, you're going to end up in the railroading situation you're going to end up in the quantum ogre situation right you're going to oh well no this room is here right like either that or you will have to pause the game for you to set up the terrain that and now nowadays i got to say there are smarter products that are out there for people that want to use a miniature right there's stuff like um uh, uh i forgot what they call like they kind of stick for that they're tied together but you can just like deploy that very fast to make a cave outline or a dungeon outline and stuff like that right uh and you mix with a with a with a battle map right so there's some option but it's always a trade-off right either you're gonna have something that is pre-planned where you kind of know in advance where the player is gonna go so you have to kind of like push them in that direction which is something like i'm worried about or you're gonna have to pause the game until like well give me a minute until i find the right battle map or set up the right thing or the, the the terrain the the location right so there's that right that that influences the, the creative that can influence the creativity and uh that's another point i forgot <laughs> sorry <laughs> i only send the questions out at least a week in advance but you know hey uh so how, no, how do you... that came to me like a well thought like uh somebody was talking note cards are my friend because i'm old and i forget everything yeah. when i use them but how, how do you incorporate since you know the 4d thing incorporates player input now this might be a nonsensical question but let's just see uh how do you incorporate player input into the design or use of battle maps during a session uh oh, so how do i use the player input during the design well that's how the do thing. you how do, yeah how do you incorporate player input into the design or use of battle maps that that's the thing like that's that's limitation that the battle maps bring right like it's unless like you want to do like uh because like you were asking like uh about limiting creativity of the player to bear right and he said like if, if you have the battle map and there's a table that drawn there right and it's in a tavern and you say like okay now like the it's generic but in the scene that you want to describe it's a tavern brawl where there's like a lot of people around right so they might be is there like a big turkey leg that you can use a, a weapon or something like that that might not be drawn on the, on the map 
but that could still be there, right? And that's something you have to discuss with the player if you want to go that way, right? That like you know, this is gonna be like the where the the furniture is gonna be, where the wall is gonna be, but that's not the limit of everything that is there. Like not every cup, not you know, if I said the tavern was busy and it's open and there's like customer around and patch patron around, right? There's gonna be stuff like lying around, you know, there's gonna be things happening, right? Okay. So you you have to you have to stress that with them. I remember the other point I want to say that also okay, like with the valve map limit, limiting creativity. If you play with the grid, especially right, that's gonna impact the design. Oftentimes, it's gonna impact the design of the map you can create. Like if you say you have a square that's five feet, and then a character can occupy one square, only one character per square, right? Then can you make a passage that you have to squeeze two people at the same time in much narrower thing, right? It's like Sometimes you're gonna you're gonna design those map with those limitations as well, right? You're gonna design the map with the rules of the system, and that's a limitation to the creativity. That's gonna influence your creativity. Okay. Yeah, I tend to I tend to agree that uh, games that have battle maps tend to have more stickler rules that, to me, get in the way. I, that shield, we're not going to discuss it again, but the whole shield rule that I ran into in, in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. And wow. and, and what, Bear was, what Bear was saying about like the room that is short and then you have a long weapon, right? You know, like That's something I want the player to consider, right? If you mm -hmm. have a spear and maybe you know, or you have like a glaive, right? Uh, maybe you're not able to swing around in a corridor. Hope you run forward. <laughs> That's and all you can be able to do with I don't, like you know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you, but like in a, in a in a medieval dungeon, five feet wide corridor, not really a thing. Ten feet wide corridor, even less so. But that's what you're gonna see every time in the in D and D, right? Yep. So. There's that, right? That's that's a big Yeah, anybody who's traveled map. and actually seen real dungeons or even real castles, how small and tight those things were is absolutely this and how steep the stairs are yeah. is Very absolutely small. Like, insane. You compare, like it's much smaller than the, like the average American house. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. You don't, even, you don't even need to go into Europe for that. Here in North America, we have lots of um colonial area era revolutionary era battle forts we can go into and so they're tiny go down to lewin oh you wouldn't you're all americans well you would as a canadian uh, go down to louisburg in nova scotia and try and walk the picket line which is basically the trench that they use to put all the soldiers in and i swear to god if i turn yep. to like face the the direction of the thing my shoulders are almost touching each wall there's not a lot of room in there you know so the idea of being able to swing a sword and all that is going to go out the window real quick but like you said, the maps always have five feet, ten feet, twenty feet, and bigger because the maps are not designed to be realistic interpretations of how castles work or dungeons work, but playable locations for yep. adventures to happen. Yep. Exa adventure sites, as, as uh, Forbidden Lands calls them, and I and I agree with that. And sometimes you have to remind players, of, like the really pedantic historical players, of that as well. Yes, I know there's no such thing as chain mail. It's actually mail, M I L L E, but I don't care. The game has chain mail. There's studded leather in the game as well. Deal with it. Who cares? You know, let's move on. It's a game, and sometimes you do have, or it's a fantasy world. It's a completely different world. Um, Connell, all right, you get to shine now, buddy. This is all about you. How do battle maps and miniatures influence the flexibility and creativity of your game sessions? Go! It's a moving board. Uh, you have to be creative. You have to be flexible. Nothing is stagnant. Your players move. The villains move. The scenery can somewhat move if it's if they're on a on a boat or something that's traveling. There's nothing static about a uh, a battle map everything is continuously moving so you as a dm have to be creative you have to try to be at least a couple steps uh in front of your players or they're just going to run through it in thanks for coming out um you have the character you have a character like me that runs across the room jumps on the table grabs the turkey leg throws it at the guard okay now i'm here now the a dm has to uh, measure out what he's going to do because of it. Nothing is static, and because of that, that invent that invites flexibility, creativity. Um, can you, can you give a quick example? 
from say a recent session or something? Yeah. Uh, all right. I have a uh, trying to think of something really quick. Sorry. Okay. I can come back to you on this one and ask you a different follow up for now. But if you yeah, because yeah, examples yeah, examples just help. So how do you adapt? How do you adapt when players want to do something outside the scope of the prepared battle map? Hey, I want a dimension door over here, but it's not on the map. Then you or whatever, Any, anything. I just I, that just popped in my head for some players, reason. For better or worse, to a certain degree, let them. If I want a dimension door from here to there, but the map there's no there, then me as a DM needs to draw out the what you're popping into. There's no reason the map has to be stuck it can grow um being a bar yeah there's buildings that should be if you're just in the building or going upstairs or downstairs whatever that's a stagnant building sure whatever but if you're dimensioning door out somewhere else then you have to draw out or use uh theater of the mind say well you land out in the bushes uh next to a, a well you have to continuously go where the players are direction it can't be all or nothing. Nothing should be all or nothing, especially in, in RPG games. And for example, I had, ah, there we go. I had a player that wants to uh, teleport, you dimension door, a teleport from here to the other side of the room. Well, the other side of the room, there was nothing drawn out. So I'm using uh, roll 20. I drew something out really quick, as fast as I can, and made it happen. You, just, you don't be stagnant. You have to be flexible. You have to be credible. Even the players, to a certain degree, have to be that way. Yes. But if you're using a pre-designed map and you don't have the ability to draw something out at your table, let's say I've got a printed map at my table. I'm not using a VTT. I'm at my table, and I've got a printed map. I went and I got printed up at the print shop, and now i got to ruin that thing I just spent 40 bucks on to draw a temporary extra room on it, even if there is no room on the paper to draw it. You don't have any make- paper? I, I live in 2024. If I have paper, it's a miracle these days. If I have a pen, it's a miracle these days. So the thing is, is that like, I understand what you're saying, Connell, but I'm just saying it's not easy or convenient. But their joy should not be on your convenience. Their joy? <laughs> their happiness. They're them continuing to want to play the game. Connell, you are an amazing human being because you, uh, that is actually something we are going to discuss next year, specifically the roles of a player, roles and expectations of players and roles and expectations of game masters. Might be, might be the difference of basically being a paid GM versus a normal GM in that you have to deliver on all this stuff that they mm-hmm. want. Well, even if you're not being paid, even if it's just a house and group of friends wanting to get together, you have no game if there's no asses and seats. Okay, so but the asses, seat, the asses and the seats aren't going to quit because they said, I want a dimension door to another room that's not on the map. And I say, well, there is no other room in the map that you can dimension door. I, I, and I don't disagree with you, but who knows what's going to uh, take that person off. Humans are feckle at best. So feckle? I just feckle. <laughs> Let's just go on, go on. <laughs> okay, I get what you're saying. It sounds like you're combining. There's me in the pickle. word police today. You can't handle this. I am because you guys are saying bag and bag and feckle. It's weird. Uh, I feel like I've the right word to use. I don't. When I sit down in the game, pickle. even if uh, even if I'm not getting paid for, I always bring extra scratch paper and everything else I think I might need. I was never a Boy Scout, but damn, I come prepared for anything I'm getting my ass into. And that's um, fair. I'm just saying, giving them everything they want isn't necessarily going to make them happy. Oh, I don't. I just want them to come back and pay me. That's really all I care about. No, um, oh, so my point stands. <laughs> <laughs> but you can no, no, still I have a keep it. Go for it. I have a question for you. Like, I, like, uh, I want to ask you because you mentioned like uh, roll twenty that you can draw a map real quick. Like, when you're in the shop in person, like, what do you do? Like, do you have like a uh, like terrain? Do you do yeah. uh, a printed map? Do you do the grid that you just drawn with dry erase? What is it? What's your approach on that? I have, and also, uh, and then also the other question I'm interested in that, like, if you had to add something, how much time do you allow yourself to draw it or to set it up? With building battle maps, in my in my experience, you always can recycle them for other situations. Mm-hmm. So if I need to throw an extra room, 
uh, I'll then I'll use a room that you know I drew whatever I have a file not file but I have a folder a vanilla folder that I I throw my maps in, and yeah sometimes I hold on I, no, let him let him finish let him finish. Okay, but I want to come back to this what you just said. Uh yes I use Contrain. I will hijack the uh Warhammer figs and throw them on the map. I will hijack whatever I need to get my story down the road. Um, I will bring grid paper. I like what Max uh, said. I have a vinyl map from Chess Masters or whatever it's called that's probably older than I am. I just nice. come prepared. I make sure I have everything I need. Uh, in real life, I cook for a living. So I'm always have to be flexible. I always have to think, okay, three steps ahead of how I'm going to do this. My gaming style as, uh, is not much different than the way I cook. I just okay, but you just said an extra room. An extra room. If, I, yeah. if I've designed the, the, the battle map to contain the location I have created for the adventure, why would I need an extra room? All the rooms are accounted for. This is what they get to interact with. They don't get to invent more rooms. Because maps are normally not 3D that, you know, they have in holodecks. They're a flat thing. That I want to go upstairs into a part of all right. This is the room you guys are staying in. Yeah, you know, okay. it, often, it, time, often time also, like people don't have maps for everything, they have maps for where encounter is gonna happen, right? Where maps are for combat, right. Right, basically. If you're just like walking through a room, right? But now, like, so a lot of it is not gonna be mapped out, I guess, right? Is that fair? If it is, yeah, not everything is gonna be mapped out. If they're walking through a tavern, I have like the shop has uh, the miniatures that has the bar, tables, chairs, uh, yep. beer, turkey legs. If I really looked hard enough, well, like for if it. I say, if I say, like, now we're in the tavern and we're just like between adventure, we're making a plan. Do you take out the tavern map for that? And then I say, I want to sell, I want to go sell some shit at the blacksmith, right? Do you then take a battle map for the shop? And you know, do you like, or just say, like, I want that party. I see what everybody wants to do. All right, you have your five seconds of fame. You have your five seconds in the light. And I break it out that way if everybody's not on the same page and has multiple different things they want to do. Because downtime is always going to be herding cats. But if it's not a battle, why do you need a map? Why not? Because it slows everything down to a crawl. I don't have i normally don't run into that but i'm not understand the, the benefit of a map when there's no battle happening get the layout of the tavern because you know that pcs are going to start a battle there anyway okay well that's fair but at the same time the yeah battle map or the uh, it's, i it's just do, right this if you bring out a I battle would... map i'm gonna start a battle <laughs> exactly if you put me in a room and be like well i'm gonna throw this asshole out the window there's this no window. Is 4D bitch, was... There's a window right there. <laughs> this is how I started with 3.5 with the DM that has to have maps for everything. That's how I got started in the hobby, and I took it from his key, you know, uh, his point of view. I like having extra maps because I never know what the players are going to do. Fair. Have you ever played the D&D 4E? No. No. I'm, I'm, I'm playing... I, you. This one, this one was really designed for like with battle map in mind, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, it felt too much like, like uh, an MMA for me. I, I just MMO, MMA, MMA. MMA, <laughs> MMA yeah. <laughs> you know, right? I, I just forgot about the dice. My attack, but I'm in an arm bar now. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. All right, let's uh, let's move. On. I, I I hear what you're saying. Um, do have another question to get to for this segment here. A lot also comes from comments on here. Somebody mentioned, I already forget who it is. Somebody mentioned earlier Quantum Ogre. I'm actually pro Quantum Ogre, believe it or not. If I want I you to meet the Ogre, I will put that damn thing wherever the hell I want to put it in order for you to meet it. If, if that is important to me for whatever reason, I really do not have a problem with the Quantum Ogre concept. Uh, and I don't understand why people do. What was that? I think this answers my exact view on the quantum yeah. ogre. I, I don't think I understand. I'm having a brain fart. You know what a quantum ogre is? 
Is it just a random monster you put in a room? No, the monster? ogre is in room A, but the players avoid room A and go to room B, C, and D. Well, you just move the ogre over to room D to have the yeah, ogre. Yeah, ogre. Right. yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, you just. Maybe it would be better to be Heisenberg's ogre. <laughs> Heisenberg's ogre. He sells you meth. Um, <laughs> damn right. <laughs> but, but. Say my name. Like, uh, like the, the reason I could, like, like. For me, like quantum ogre, because like there's not like I don't want you to meet an ogre necessarily, right? Because I don't prep, I don't have like thing like you know I lay brick as we travel on the road, right? I put the road down, so there's no, there's no thing that I plan in advance that I want you to meet that I'm gonna move. There's nothing to move, because nothing nothing exists yet. That's why like that's that's not a problem for me. I got you. I I, no, I, I I get it. I but I do plan. I, now I don't plan crazily. I don't go world building for each week. But I definitely plan. I want this to happen. I want that to happen. I hope the next thing happens. Sometimes, literally, none of that happens. We've got stories about that. Sometimes it works perfectly. Sometimes, wow, they went through that quicker than I thought, and I still have to make crap up on my own. Whatever. But but there are things based on what they decided they're doing at the end of last session that yeah, I do want them to move forward in this direction. They still have the freedom to go wherever they want, but. If, as they're going for, let's use the dungeon example, because I think that's perfect, because dungeons are generally linear, right? If they're going through the dungeon, and it was an A, and they skipped A, but there's a magic item I want them to get, or uh, there's a, there's a, just some sort of interaction that I think is important for them, I absolutely will move it. Hell, in uh, Crafty's got it in my module, if they don't meet the big bad there, it actually says where they should meet the big bad at another place. So... Uh, anywho, let's uh, let's hit some comments here, and uh, just as a reminder, some a random RPG live stream airs live on Fridays at 6 p.m. Central Time, except for the last Friday of the month. Once this live stream ends, the full live stream will remain available for YouTube members only. All the four discussion segments will post about a month later for the public. So. Uh, no super chats. I don't know why I'm reading all these non super chats. Actually, because they're good and they're they're helping make points here or or uh, question us. Walter MC, it's probably noted that there's not an insignificant portion of the population that simply doesn't have the cape capacity to mentally visualize. Well, here's something that I'm going to say that's going to really trigger some people. Role playing games aren't for everybody, and I. That's just. There you go. They're not for everybody. Go ahead, Bear. And the vast majority of the population can. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, like, I'm sorry, but if you can visualize, like, you know, it's like, if you don't have legs and you don't have arms, I'm not the guy to teach you how to swim. I don't know. You can, like, you know, maybe you can do it, but you shouldn't ask me to tell you how to do it, right? Like, I'm sorry. I'm not just, I just don't know how to teach you that. What was that wrong to say? <laughs> no, it's just, I'm just imagining you as a swimming instructor. All right, then you go. <laughs> Uh, and then there are then there are a couple of opposite. Uh, so yes, I agree with Connell. I'm the GM. I'm here to make my players have fun and the game be damned. Sometimes on the flip side of that, I'm not responsible for anyone else's joy. Who the hell needs that kind of static when trying to just play a damn game? And that's why I, I like. Totally. What's that? Hmm? I think you're responsible to your own fun, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the game master is responsible for the fun. I do believe that the game master is responsible for uh, narrating the world, at, wherever the, the characters are, and for setting challenges in front of the characters. I don't believe in pure sandbox, and nobody, even when, like, Mr., uh, not Mr. Max, it's, uh, with, like, Basic Expert and Victor were on talking about, uh, you know, the whole sandbox stuff uh, with Heathen Dog. I'm not railroady as Heathen Dog, but I don't believe in pure sandbox. I just don't. I think those... Honestly, I think those games are dumb. I've been doing it for 40 years. That's great. You've been playing bad games for 40 years. You, and you can continue to play bad games. It's okay. Um, but I'm more, definitely more sandboxy in general. But there are going to be choices that the characters make. And those choices are going to be how I detail the next adventure that they go on or the next session that we have and so forth. So, uh, Oops, I can delete that one. And then... Connell Cigar was also great in Captain Max's sessions. Nevertheless, back to topic. You know what? Connell the bug man. <laughs> oh, God. I forgot about that. Sort of. Just remember, Connell, who let you live? Yeah. Everybody else wanted to kill you. I let you go. It's like being in high school again, surrounded by assholes. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, who is next? Uh, it looks like a Mr. Max. Mr. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Max Boyvon. Uh, how, this is a, this is a good question for you too, sir. How do you foster creativity and flexibility using theater of the mind? Giving freedom to the player. You know, we touched about that before, right? Just like in the previous video, if you're looking on the replay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah giving giving like and encouraging them to to fill in the blank right like i'm i'm not going to describe every little detail but you understand what's in there you understand what the what the context involved and stuff like that bringing up with some some stuff and i also mentioned that if they are not bringing up bring coming up with stuff have your npc do it right and lead, lead by example and I play with great player usually, and they're good at that. So like the player that are lagging a bit, they're going to catch on to it as well. But like, why for me, like the allowing the freedom is so important is because I don't want you to limit your imagination to only the thing that I said, because I cannot say everything. It's going to be too long. It's going to be too slow. Okay. I had a follow up for you. Oh, what challenges have you faced keeping the game structured while allowing this full creative freedom? And how did you manage them? The biggest challenge, like sometimes misunderstanding does happen. And we try to avoid the oh, actually thing, right? We, we try to, if, if there's a correction that needs to be done, we try to do it like as smoothly as possible. And then, like the usually the other guy, like say, oh, I thought like there's no, there's not gonna be like back and forth. Like it's kind of part of the sort of contract. Like you thought something was one way, you're being corrected. You just accept. You don't like don't don't fucking don't don't argue, right? And um, and don't try to, you know, like I said, like keep your if you're doing like the theater of the mind. You got freedom that you can do a lot of stuff. Don't try to do too much. Do one thing, and and, and like like I said, keep your turn short. Don't like do don't don't pre-plan your next reaction. Keep your turn short, and you're gonna have another turn next. And when you're the GM, don't re-narrate what the player just narrated, because then that just slowed down the thing, just slow down the turn, and. He said what he's gonna do. You don't have to. Okay, like oh, I jump over the table and grab the chandelier. Like I jump on the table and grab the chandelier. Right? That's that can be done in one turn. It's short enough. Okay. When the GM don't GM don't don't go back and say okay, you grab on the table and grab the chandelier. Okay, you next. He just said it. You don't have to repeat it. Keep things going. Keep things flowing. Right. That's also like a thing. Yeah, but could, say, could like, that sometimes be done just to verify? Like sometimes I will do that, not to repeat back to be boring, but just to get in my own brain. Okay, this is what the character uh, the character did, and I'm kind of, I guess, processing that in my own head at that time. Uh, yeah, I can. I, I could see that that can be done by like that. Like, and I'm not saying like I'm not saying like oh you're an asshole for doing that and you're ruining the game, right? <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm saying it's I'm saying it's a bad habit, right? It's something like I would say, I would encourage you, like if you tend to do that, like, and I often say like the GM shouldn't talk after every player, like have your turn as a GM, let the player go, right? And then they all describe what they do. And then like you describe what happened and like let the, what the NPC does, the NPC get their turn as well. Because you don't, because that's also a lot of the player, like say, if you narrate every time, like, oh, I do, I'm going to run to the door. And then you narrate what happened at the door. Then the other player say, well, I want to I want to follow him. Well, now it's too late because you did you solve all this interaction there, right? If you go around and say I run to the door and then say I follow him and then the next guy says something and then you're at the gym okay at the door there's that and then they go you, now you can resolve everything like in the same time. It allows people to act, you know. So this is something I would say also to avoid the chaos. Everybody takes their turn. You have a turn as a GM, right? Let people talk. Don't talk after each each of them. Uh, they're just, in my opinion, like bad habit that don't add that much. If you can like move all, all the day if you need it, maybe I guess to fix it in your mind. But usually I would say like you know, 
let the player describe it. And also, if you don't repeat what, if you don't re-narrate what the player narrate, you're gonna incentivize them more to narrate themselves what they're doing, right? Instead of just like being boring. Okay, I know one of the things that you guys, uh, at least Shauna specifically, preached a lot was that it should be like a you know, a movie. I I disagree with that completely. I think it should be like a novel, not like a movie. But I get the point. Uh, that's why like being a little bit slower in my case a little bit more exposition a little more detail a little more description i actually think is a good thing personally but i understand what you're trying to go for with the 4d stuff i just i don't want an, a two-hour action movie i want a book that i read over the course of you know days weeks whatever yeah but like like from like i think that the like six six second round for like you know i think that for me that's long right i want like Keep it shorter so we can like you can have more round just like you know and keep things moving like i want like like people say like you want things cinematic sometimes i say we should say like one thing kinematic we want thing thing being moving right? yeah but there's a difference between combat rounds and and rope so i guess maybe this is just a personal take uh i don't believe that you should be using combat rounds ever unless you're literally in combat and even a lot of that combat doesn't need rounds if if bear snipes you i'm not going to start combat rounds bear's just going to take the shot yeah. like well we we pretty much do like everything in round okay like kind of like loosely right we're just like but it's just an habit that we have that we took now and allows especially when you play online it allows like everybody to have their turn and not speak over each other so we just like usually go around the, around the table that just work well sometimes like okay. people are gonna skip or if we have like dialogue like we can do like some back and forth we have some rules for that that's a bit beyond this this topic but when it comes to combat like what i encourage people is like now shorten your turn your round right like we still gonna go around the same order but like shorter like do okay. less well let, let's uh that kind of delves outside of the uh the yeah. battle map uh, theater of mind thing so and uh connell's falling asleep and bears decided to go dining out tonight so uh, uh let's bring connell in here right now. uh connell um, bears trying to be respectful i know <laughs> with you're not being respectful to mr max because he had to just talk to me okay. <laughs> I talked to the audience through you through through me <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right connell how do you foster creativity and flexibility using theater of the mind you can do it i normally okay how about this how about this can you discuss a time when the lack of physical tools led to a particular creative moment or memorable moment well, I can somewhat answer the question. Uh, not for uh, I will use the of the mind when they are talking to uh, the uh, the if I have a, uh, when they are talking to the like the big bad or to somebody. I will like draw out he is sitting uh, how what the room looks like. But I this this is a weak point for me. I hate you, Crafty. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Probably. But I will, I will use theater of the mind when I need to describe a room or something that the map just does not do. Paizo gave out some interesting maps, but sometimes they worked. A lot of times they didn't. So I had to explain what certain things look like to, for... Uh, for the players to uh, give them a chance to understand, you know, what is around them to give them the chance, uh, the ability to say, uh, ability to act upon it. Uh, if they jump over the table and stab them in the eye with a toothpick, you know, I will give them the ability to do so by describing what's going on or the room around them. Okay. And I was you listening. It's just, you were, you were answering you were answering the follow-up so yeah i'm sorry baron's making fun of me because he's short bear so much hate in this room <laughs> uh how yeah, do you foster creativity and flexibility using theater of the mind and since i already know you basically answered this i'm going to jump right in to this one how do you balance the need for structure with the freedom that theater of the mind provides. What is this 
freedom of which you speak. It is not the way of my people. That's supposed to be my line. <laughs> like that's the only place I like freedoms in a role-playing game. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, players are going to push limits. They're going to push boundaries. They're going to test. They're going to try and find where the where the breakpoint is. That's where they will learn the end of their freedom. Is when they reach the breakpoint. That's where their freedom ends, and the reality of the game, or the universe, or the setting, or whatever, takes over. <laughs> Hence why Connell's earlier thing about, oh, you're there for the happiness of the players. Well, the players better be goddamn well happy playing in the game I've created for them, not inventing parts of the game that they want to have happen. If they want that, <laughs> they can go do story time at the library and, and try and add new chapters to books during the middle of the reading. And, and join Mr. Works. Max's game. Yep. Or, or join Play 4D style where you have more freedom in that regard. For me, it's a dance. And their creativity will be based on the music I play. And sometimes they'll change the music through the dance they do. Oh, crazy, I know. But it makes it more fun and dynamic. It's not a free-for-all, and it's not a non-for-all. And with all due respect to Mr. Max and the 4D idea, there's a lot of rules they've gotten rid of in games. But you've been listening, there's a lot of rules they've added to the games, which are their social contract and how they interact with things and what they can and cannot do. So they're just using different rules to achieve the goal they want. Theater of the like mind. We have, we have we have rules for we have rules for role play that we find like oftentimes are missing in the in the in the game, right? Uh, yeah. A little game have rules for combat, not much rules for role play. Which I agree with you on that, but at the same time, in a theater of the mind game, you can literally add that room, Connell, like that. Oh, you yeah. move the tapestry, and there's a wooden door, and that oh, is it locked? I don't know. Are you testing the door? And then watch as they go, oh, oh, and they start debating whether or not they're testing the door. Because now that you've asked them that simple question, their paranoid player mind has kicked into gear. And they're not sure if the door is trapped or something else. And they become scared. And that becomes the back and forth between the player and the GM. The theater of the mind does exceptionally well. It does help to be a good GM for theater of the mind if you've done some improv theater. Because you learn to not block you learn to respond as opposed to just say no. Yes, sometimes GMs have to say no. I agree with that theory 100%. But when it comes to exploring and stuff like that, you can have a lot more fun by being a little more flexible. And theater of mind provides you that flexibility because you don't need to have a mountain of possible terrain choices or a whiteboard to draw on or any of that other stuff. You can just get to the business of playing the yeah. game. That answer your and question? I'm Oh, sorry. Yes. I mean, we're not in the open table yet. We're not in the open table yet, you French fuck. Well, now we are. Because <laughs> we started with Mr. Max. We are now. Now we're at the free part. Like I, I like a, I'm very much so, so like a minimalistic GM in a sense that I want to use the least artifact possible. Right? I'm not a fan of module. I'm not a fan of a supplement book. You know. And I don't want to you. I don't want to have to drag a bunch of thing when I run when I want to run, right? I like. I, I want to have like a yeah, a minimalistic game, right? Simplified, purified, free of all the materialistic good as much as possible in the head. I'm I'm liking less and less the use of the use of picture, right? But I want it to happen in your head. I want you to use your noggin. <laughs> Sorry, but yeah, so that's something that that's something that uh, I'm aligning on bear on that, right? Just like I just want to get on the table. Well, and I'll probably go further than him, but like yeah, and I don't want to have to drag a carry on right with me. You most definitely go further than me. Yeah. The Edge Lord, you've actually made a couple comments in here. I don't know why I can't respond to you. I can't. Uh, the person who likes minis on the panel is Connell. Mm -hmm. Bears used them. I've used them. I'm more hybrid between. I lean definitely lean theater of the mind, but I will use minis in case my horrible descriptions of whatever I'm trying to say don't <laughs> don't don't actually uh, pan out. So you know, there's a little bit of abstraction there, or just uh, sometimes I just do it because I understand that players like that. Uh, but I'm definitely leaning in the theater mind camp, and he's pure, hundred percent unadulterated uh, theater of the cranium. Yep. 
And like uh, what Zonara said, like I, he's talking about video game for Battle Tech, like, and that's the thing. I also like, I think that changed with the over the year, right? Now that we have video games that are very good at doing the tactical stuff, right? The, the tactical battle, and if if that's what I want, that can scratch my itch. So, with the with those other hobbies that evolve and that develop, right? Like. I had to focus. That's why. That's part of the reason why I focus like role playing games so much on the role playing on the thing that this hobby is the only hobby that can do right. The thing that other thing cannot do. Video game cannot do like the no prep thing. Video game cannot do just the pure theater of the mind. Video game cannot do like all those right. Yeah, but video games are set up different. One of the things that I don't like about video games compared to RPGs, and I know that computer <laughs> games you know are based on RPGs, but they don't make great RPGs, is uh, it's this mindset, and I've really seen this mindset grow since the SSI games of the 80s, and even just it, gets, it seems to be getting worse and worse. And that if encounter must must engage, and that's something that I don't uh, I don't agree with. And and I'm being facetious here in some degree, but I'm trying to plant the seed in your mind of like w w what I'm trying to point out here is people will be like well, I, I'll just save my game and try again kind of concept, right? It's like, no, no, no. How would your character save really them. react in, in this situation? It's a role-playing game. It's not a computer simulation, you know. Also, like in the video game, you have the assumption that it's going to be like a fair encounter balance for your level and stuff like that. You shouldn't have that in role-playing game, in my opinion, right? Just like, you know, the thing is here because it makes sense that it's here. Not because you can you can challenge it and you can defeat it, right, right. All right. Anything you guys want to? Uh, by the way, uh, for you three, uh, I did put a poll in the YouTube chat. I want to say it again. Uh, Rumble isn't working. I don't know why Streamyards will not connect with the with the Rumble. So anybody who wanted to watch on Rumble, sorry. Uh, I know you're either here or you're not watching, but StreamYard is not connecting with my Rumble account right now, at least for this video, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, but, uh, so here's the thing. I, this is for, let me put it up for Malachi and a couple of the comments that I got in here. Where is it? Um, why not both? Because it's essentially to find a preference. Because otherwise what's going to happen is you're going to get 99% of the people. Well, that one time I did use the mini, so I basically do both. Or the person's going to be like, well, I do theater of the mind because I described the scene that they're on with the battle map. Like, no, what is your preference? Do you prefer theater? If you had to pick one, take your minis with you to the desert island or take your books with you to the desert island. Which one do you do? You know, uh, And you know, I know there's a few comments in there, but oh, I do both. Well, uh, pick a team. <laughs> Anything else you guys want to say uh, uh, to each other? Or do we want to talk I about... Uh, you all. Aw. Okay. Or do we want to dive into player preference and dynamics? Yes. Let's go to the next segment. No? Okay. I just want to make sure you guys got everything out that you want to get out. So, uh, over here. I can't believe how quickly this is going. So We'll talk more on segment five. <laughs> <laughs> that's when we're going to start the fight segment five is when the fights happen people we don't do it on the videos well i guess segment one this time but <laughs> segment five we're uh, going to be <laughs> we're going to be at each other's throats we're going to hate each other you're going to see the real hatred amongst the panelists but if you enjoy this discussion please like this video subscribe to all of the panelists channels which you can find in the description and if you cry at me that oh, i don't see connell in there we'll blame him he didn't give me anything 